Let me tell you, as someone who's here for first service, y'all are in for a treat today. <laughs> My name is Beth Monholland, and I am honored and thrilled to serve as your worship associate today and to welcome you fully into this space. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, histories, ethnicities, and bodies here. We welcome your heart, your mind, and your spirit here. We welcome all that you bring with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We extend a special welcome to each guest among us. We invite our guests to fill out a welcome card located in the pew rack in front of you and drop it in the offering plate later in the service. Guests may also pick up a welcome packet at the rear of the sanctuary where folks will also find hearing assist devices and braille hymnals. And of note, there is a fragrance-free area in the first few pews on the right side of the congregation. If you are a visiting family today, including children or youth, after the seminarian's ritual noted in your order of service, we invite you to join the children's recessional and head across the hall to the common room. Someone will orient you to religious education there. Immediately following the service, everyone is invited for coffee and conversation in the common room. And my name again is Beth, and I invite you to talk with me at the guest table there. As a way to engage at First Church, I invite everyone to explore the announcements insert for the numerous opportunities available here. In particular, let me draw your attention to just a few. Please join the 2020 Pledge Team's Weaving Project today during coffee hour as we continue to encourage you to pledge as we reach our goal to become a pledge-sustained congregation. The Chronologically Gifted Group will be meeting for its February meeting today after the second service at 1230 in Max Auto Hall. No dish to share, no problem, everyone is welcome. A celebratory suffragette luncheon is scheduled for Saturday, March 14th from 11 to 2 and will feature history, poetry, music, luscious food, and perhaps even some attendees dressed as suffragists. There's a sign up during the coffee hour. Please find details on these and more events in the announcements insert. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our pulpit guest, the Reverend Dr. William Sinkford, who currently serves as the Senior Minister of First Unitarian Church of Portland, Oregon. Reverend Sinkford is probably best known for his service as president of the Unitarian Universalist Association from 2001 through 2009. His tenure was marked by strong public witness for social justice and support for marginalized communities. He earned his BA from Harvard in 1968 and holds honorary doctorates from Tufts University and Meadville Lombard Theological School. Reverend Sinkford was the first African American to lead any traditionally white denomination and was named one of the 10 most influential black leaders in the US in both 2005 and 2006. He and his wife Maria have four adult children and one grandchild. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Sinkford to First Church. And finally, so that when we all stay fully present with each other this morning, please make sure that you've silenced any electronic devices for the remainder of the service. Once again, I welcome you to First Church, and I invite you to join me in the unison reading of our mission, which is printed in your order of service. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. And now, I'd like to invite Aidan Colley Hefter to come forward and light our chalice this morning. Words inspired by the Reverend Sarah York. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of wholeness, let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are. And as we pause on the cutting edge of our lives, let us prepare ourselves to welcome hope into our hearts, joy into our spirits, and love into our lives. Come now and let us worship together.
In our living tradition of Unitarian Universalism, our ministers arise from, are formed in, and then called out of our congregations. As each of us individuals weaves our unique thread into the tapestry of this congregation, so too is our congregation one of the, the tapestry of the living tradition of Unitarian Universalism. From our lineage of ministers, last century Dr. Bailey and then John Cyrus and then the century Bridger Drew Kennedy and Craig Schwallenberg and Dina McFeeters this century and then myself and of course all of the ministers who will come after us serving this congregation and serving our living tradition. Our congregation has also had a number of ministers who have heard their calling to ministry from within First Church. And today we are recognizing three of our members who are in the midst of their formation process. The process from lay leader to minister is a long and involved one. And our own Kimberly Tomjack Carlson, who is at the culmination of her process, is going to share those steps with you all. The story I have for you today is a long story, but alas, I am not the featured speaker today, so I will use my storyteller magic to make it as short as possible. Here is the Cliff Notes version of ministerial formation. Once upon a time, something called to those of us who have chosen ministry. A message was received from the nucleus of our souls telling us we needed to try this thing. Perhaps it was a sacred responsibility to serve people, the need to speak truth and create ritual, something, something called to each of us to believe that ministry was our path in life. So we filled out that first application to seminary, which requires recommendations from ministers and a church plus a comprehensive essay of all significant life-shaping events and the meaning you have derived from your existence so far. <laughs> really. <laughs> the soul delving will continue when you're in seminary where for a minimum of three years you will learn and write, write, there are so many words to write about this very short list, it's longer, but I made it short, theology, religious history, sacred scriptures, and preaching. Plus, you will complete a chaplaincy training and an internship at a congregation so that you may graduate with a degree in divinity. <laughs> divinity, though, is not enough <laughs> to become a UU fellow midship minister. You must also pass an evaluation of the ministerial fellowship committee, and then finally, all you, you clergy have also been ordained by a Unitarian Universalist congregation to earn their title of reverend, a sacred duty that only a congregation can bestow upon a minister in our faith. So we have three members of this congregation who are currently in seminary, and they are at various stages along this process. If you'd like to talk with any one of them to learn more about their experience or about seminary or the process of ministerial formation, they are going to be with us during coffee hour next to the membership table. So these seminarians in the process of ministerial formation have been called to their service to our living tradition from among you. Will Omega Burkhart and Denise Cauley and Monica Kling Garcia now please come up to the chancel. Our seminarians are each gonna share a little bit with you about how this congregation influenced their call to ministry. It's just one of the many ways in which this church changes the world. Denise, will you start us off? This congregation is where I first heard messages of LGBTQ welcoming, pro-choice support, and love for our earth. The first place I saw young adults and women in the pulpit has been here. 
My art has been on these walls. This church let me weave together justice, creativity, and feminine spirituality. Those were integral in shaping my theology of beauty and inspiring me to queer this faith. Black filmmaker, writer, and professor Tony Kare Bambara says, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for exposing me to irresistible ministry. Hello all, uh, my name is Monica Kling Garcia. My call to ministry was something I had felt in my childhood as a Catholic, but was long forgotten by the time I had entered the doors of this church. During my time here as a member, this community lovingly gave me opportunities to explore this faith. From oofta brunches to circle suppers, leading RE classes to preaching my very first sermon, this church brought me back into a faith community and showed me my call was welcome here. First Church saw the light of my ministry and gave it a home of a chalice, and for that I am grateful. Well, I'm here to tell you that the involved congregant to lay leader to seminarian pathway sometimes works, <laughs> dear people. I became a Unitarian Universalist in this sacred space, guided by gentle friends and the gentler light coming from those windows. After a session of Harvest the Power came Midwest Leadership School, which in turn led to committees and board positions, both here and regionally. And when my call to ministry turned from a quiet yet incessant tap on the shoulder to a full-fledged symphonious hymn, I was able to embrace my song thanks to the love and dedication I experienced and continue to experience in this congregation and from its leadership here. And for that, I am deeply grateful and humbled to carry the light that was first ignited in me right here out into the world. We got a lot of preachers up on the chancel today. <laughs> And our seminarians would love to receive the congregation's blessing as they carry that light out forth into the world. So um, I'm going to invite the ministers who are up on the chancel with me here to read the minister portion of the responsive reading. The congregation, you're going to read the congregation's part, and the seminarians will respond with the seminarian's part. So congregation, will you please rise in body or spirit for our responsive reading? In this moment, intersecting past and future, they are part of our living tradition. We give you our blessing in your calling to bless the world. You take us forward with you, and your presence will stay with us from your time as one of us. Go forth with our blessing, in formation, your studies, your internship, and your journey towards ordination and fellowship. 
go forth with our blessing and our love. <laughs> and seminarians, we're also going to send you forth with a gift from us to carry with you. Congregation, this is a little chalice pin that is our branded First Unitarian chalice. Um, so they get to have us with them wherever they go. Let's now bless our seminarians also with a round of applause. I'd invite our children, youth, and teachers to sing verse 1 of the children's recessional hymn now, number 95. There is more love somewhere, and then the rest of the congregation will sing you, as, sing you along your way as you proceed to your classes. Will you pray with me now? Spirit of life and of love, known by many names and no name, great mystery at the heart of things, dear God. We gather in community, bringing all the hurts and the hopes of our lives, all the joys that lift us up and all the struggles that press us down. We gather at this time and in this place to claim a vision for beloved community, a vision that helps us hold fast to our hopes even when hope is hard to find. Here and now we renew connection to ourselves and to the integrity for which we hope and toward which we aspire. We renew connection to the love that holds us all and that holds all that we love. Now, in this hour, we open our hearts, even our hearts that are broken and bruised, trusting that the spirit of life will move within us. We open our hearts, even our hearts that are fearful and may want to close, trusting that the spirit of life and of love will move among us. May we discover that there is more courage in us than fear when we join together. And may we remain naive enough to speak words of love and of hope and of joy and mean them for each of us and for all of us. May that be so, and amen. Our reading this morning is by the Reverend Victoria Safford. It's entitled, In the Struggle, Singing, Shining. I once saw a little girl dressed in a fabulous outfit. She was in preschool, and her clothes were matched only by the radiance with which she wore them. A dress tie-dyed in bright orange, hot pink, an electric yellow with socks to match, pink suede sandals, and on her knee, as she revealed to me demurely by lifting the hem of her skirt, a Band-Aid in the brightest bright blue. We were out of purple ones, she explained with mild regret. 
the child was shining, shining. I admired her dress and her joie de vivre, and she said, well, I wanted to wear my favorite outfit because we're having church today, and in case I had somehow failed to guess it, this is my favorite outfit. She gave her dress a little flip. She straightened her short legs so the sandals stuck straight out. She ratcheted up those fiery socks and looked me in the eye. I thanked her humbly for her example, and wholeheartedly I meant it. Later, in the afterglow of her costume and her gladness, I thought about that girl. There are children all over the world, and some adults scattered here and there, who unfailingly will punctuate their lives and their days with sacred celebration and with rituals signifying joy, no matter what they have or don't to work with, no matter what fury the world outside is howling. They will savor life and breath and all their days, no matter what is dealt them. It's the only way some people know how to live, with gladness and cacophonous color. These people, these are people who pray without ceasing, awake and aware, chanting if they're old enough. This is the life I would risk anything to save. Gather yourselves, say the Hopi elders. See who is in the water with you and celebrate. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. Victoria goes on. There are things in this life that are so beautiful, so lovely, so simple, extraordinary, ordinary blessings that the only response sometimes is thankfulness, the kind of thankfulness that clamors for loud colors on a Sunday morning. Choose your clothing with defiance, with attitude, with joie de vivre, and with intention. Every action is a sacrament, every move a symbol, every color a song. This is a day we would risk anything to save. UU Minister Mark Harris tells a story of his father complaining about Unitarian Universalism. Your religion has no fantasy, his father said. Now this meant to him, Mark goes on, that we liberal religious folks are challenged to put laughter and joy and full-bodied experiences into our worship services. But it's also a reminder that deeper and quieter experiences of sorrow, love, grief, contrition, and connection must also be evoked in this space so that we may sit with them all and become whole in our sacred space. Become whole in our sacred space. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. So thankful that Jennifer said yes when we spoke of exchanging pulpits this year. I wanted my congregation to have the chance to hear your fine minister. Woohoo! <laughs> and I look forward to returning to Milwaukee. Now, most of you probably won't remember my last visit here. It was about a dozen years ago, and I was UUA president then. <laughs> and on that visit, I preached the good news of Unitarian Universalism. I spoke of our faith that our differences need not divide us, that they can be blessings rather than curses. Our belief that each and every one of us is worthy, each of us gifted, each of you a gift, each of you already lovable and already loved. I preach that love will, in the end, prove stronger than fear. And I spoke of our faith that love will, in the end, win. And it was a good sermon. <laughs> it's still a good sermon. <laughs> but today, I want to go a bit de deeper because you will not have missed this fact 
Things have gotten more challenging out there in the world since I was last here. It's harder to hold the hope that I promised in that sermon. And so we need to go deeper to, to understand where our tradition has grown strong and where it must grow stronger still. Unitarian Universalism. The, the Universalists, well, their reason for being was rejection of the gloomy Calvinist doctrine that a few of us would be saved, but most of us were headed in the opposite direction. It was a grim theology. Sin Sinners in the hands of an angry God was its most famous sermon. The Unitarians, from the very beginning as well, they rejected a theology based on exclusion. No saved and damned, no sheep and goats for William Ellery Channing, the father of the Unitarian faith. That's part of the origin of Unitarianism, too. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Because as much as Unitarianism was a rejection of that gloomy Calvinist view, it was also a reaction to the emotional religious awakening that was sweeping the United States when Unitarianism was being born. It was called the Second Great Awakening. There had been one before. And it was a time of joyous camp meetings with emotional preaching and great moving music. These were revivals that offered not a rational search for truth. They offered conversion. And they called for repentance. People were overcome when they were saved. The Second Great Awakening transformed the religious landscape of the United States. When it began, only two in 10 citizens, all white citizens, only two in 10 identified with any religion. When it ended in the middle of the 19th century, eight in 10 did. Wow, how could we forget that? Not mention that. Why isn't that a part of the story of the origin of our faith? When William Ellery Channing was creating the Unitarian faith as a religion of reason, he was drawing a contrast with those joyful and out of control camp meetings. Those camp meetings were not for the propertied and privileged Unitarians in their formal churches. The result, unfortunately, is that the loving God that Channing preached and the human perfectibility that he claimed became a cold and rational faith. There was some satisfaction in it, but there just was not a lot of joy. Mark Harris writes that we have struggled for membership growth ever since. <laughs> Often making our yearning and our search an intellectual exercise in rational truth seeking, while we have neglected community building and and I might add, we have neglected the life of the spirit. So, so that's a part of our story, part of how we got to be the religious people that we are. There's a reason that we yearn for wholeness in our sacred spaces. And my first point is that we need to remember all of our origins and all of our story. But that in and of itself does not tell us how we need to move today and what tools we need to shape a community worthy of being called beloved. A world in which we can find hope even in these complicated days. So given who we are and where we came from, what tools do we need? And what tools should be off the table? The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Do any of you remember Audre Lorde? A few of you at least? Oh, quite a few. She was author, poet, activist. She was a prophet. And that's one of her most famous quotes. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Have any of you heard that phrase used in the progressive circles in which you move? Hmm? None of you have heard that? Have any of you used, I see a few hands, have any of you used that phrase? I see a few hands there. I must confess that I have. You know, we need collaborative leadership here. We don't need hierarchy. Hierarchy is one of the master's tools. Let's get the hierarchy out of here. 
right? Well, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. It's become a kind of a complicated phrase. Let me tell you the story. The year was 1979, and Lord had agreed to be one of the speakers at an NYU-sponsored conference on feminism, which was a hot topic in the academy back then and now. But when she spoke, she offered a biting critique of the conference. I stand here as a black lesbian feminist, she began, having been invited to comment on the only panel at this conference where the input of black feminists and lesbians is represented. What this says about the vision of this conference is sad in a country where racism, sexism, and homophobia are inseparable. What does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? As long as we use the master's tools, she preached, only the most narrow parameters of change are possible. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Her words became transformative. They still are for many of us because we know when we hear them almost instantly and, and intuitively what they mean and we know somehow that they ring true. Or at least we think we do. Nothing can be solved by becoming the thing we want to dismantle, right? If we move into the master's house and use the tools of control that the master used, we've only changed the master. We haven't changed the control or the violence or the oppression, right? Can I have an amen to that, right? I wonder, though, if Audre Lorde's words have come to be misused or at least incompletely understood. Michael White, one of the co-founders of the Occupy movement, described Lord's phrase as the atomic bomb of discussion enders. Once you say the master's tools can't be used to dismantle the master's house in progressive circles, there's not a lot more to say, right? It can be applied to absolutely everything, from language to violence to art. If the master's tools cannot be used then, in an age when capitalism claims ownership over everything, then only resignation is possible. We should just throw up our hands and give up, I guess. Or should we? What tools should we use? Let me give you an example. The 14th Amendment, written to free the enslaved population in the US, was later appropriated and used to enshrine corporations as people leading in our day to the Citizens United decision and so much that we progressives decry. Master's tool if there ever was one, right? Does that mean we should abandon the 14th Amendment? Just give it over to the corporate lobbyists, let it go? Or should our work be to reclaim that tool as our own and question whether it was ever really implemented as it was intended? The tool of the masters that Audre Lorde focused on most was exclusion. It was the exclusion of categories of real lived human experience that she critiqued most effectively. For women, she wrote, the need and desire to nurture each other is not pathological. It is redemptive. Interdependency is the way to a freedom which allows the individual to be not in order to be used, but in order to be creative. In order to be creative. It was the exclusion of all those human truths that point toward interconnection and compassion. That was the ultimate master's tool that Lord saw. Exclusion, leaving us with only competition and scarcity. Just win, lose. No space for the valuing of difference. Is it possible, just possible, that our real lived experience, our varied and particular real lived experience can be the source of our power? Is it possible that our differences can become an incubator for compassion, not the source of fear and hatred, but compassion? 
Is it possible, is it possible that despair is not our final destination? Gather yourselves, say the Hopi elders, see who is in the water with you and celebrate, and celebrate, rejoice. The original Christian communities told their members that if you have two coats, give one of those coats to someone in need. Exclusion says you keep that extra coat. You can't spare that coat ever. You can never have too many coats. You need every coat you can acquire. <laughs> it's the old story of who's in and who's out. It's the sheep and the goats all over again, the privileged versus the expendable, the worthy versus the worthless. It is a question at heart of who we are and who we choose to be. Are we? Do we want to be merely homo economicus, the capitalist ideal interested only in acquiring more and more and more for ourselves, never satisfied as long as one of our neighbors seems to have more or bigger or better than we have? Is that who we want to be? Is that how we want to live, acquiring and hoarding what we acquire, operating out of scarcity even in our privilege, willing to bribe and bully to stay ahead? Is that where our hope lies? The study of our close cousins in the primate world tells us we have a choice. Primatologist Sarah Brosnan offered two apes in adjacent cages, and I need to acknowledge that they were in cages. She offered these apes pieces of carrot as rewards for performing a simple task. And both apes were delighted to perform the task over and over again, and they loved the carrots. Occasionally, however, she would give one of them a grape, the favorite reward, desired much more than a piece of carrot. And when one received a grape, the other would refuse to perform the task. The other would even throw the carrot back at the researcher in <laughs> anger. And that was the expected result. Homo, or in this case, primate economicus, competitive and greedy. What they did not expect was that the grape recipient, the ape that got the grape, might be upset as well. What they discovered is that the grape recipient would often refuse the grape unless their partner in the adjacent cage also got a grape. Fairness, equity, connection, relationship breaking out. Apes, chimpanzees, and small children. This experiment has been done with all three, and they all usually prefer rewards to be equal, complain when rewards are unequal, demonstrate what we would call, looking from the outside, compassion, feeling with and for the other, rather than greed. Now, I don't want to pretend that this is all simple, that we just have to choose hope, choose collaboration, choose compassion, choose love. We are all too familiar with how the ways of the world live within us, not just around us. And there's a very different conversation needed with and about those who are truly in need, the hungry and the houseless. But it is critical that we remember that we do have choices. They may not be simple and they may not be easy, but they are choices. Rejoice. You can choose. Rejoice. That is what those camp meetings were about, a choice about how to live. Reverend Deanna Vandeveer writes, to our dominant culture framed by a scarcity narrative, I offer this truth. When we see that our days are replete with abundance, we become less afraid. When we are less afraid, we connect more. The more connection we see in our lives, the more abundance we notice. It becomes a self-sustaining prophecy. As I said, this is not easy. Welcoming the rich diversity of human experience, making sure that those who are on the margins are welcomed in and into leadership, 
trusting the miracle that happens when we actually listen and learn from one another, it's not easy. Deanna goes on, sometimes the abundance will fill us up and sometimes it will wear us out. It is, however, and without doubt, a more loving way to move through the world than a life lived out of scarcity. The master's tools of divisiveness, of pitting some of us against others of us, the master's tools require life to be grim, always a competition. They require us to be on guard. It's win, lose, all the way. And being on guard makes it almost impossible to feel joy. Oh, we may feel some satisfaction at a victory or two along the way when we've defeated somebody else, but I believe real joy is harder to come by. And perhaps the most radical thing I have to say to you today is that joy, delight in one another, awe at the diversity of the complex persons with whom we journey, and the wonder of the world we have received, joy may be the most radical tool in our toolbox. From a conversation between Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, it's called the Book of Joy, the words of the Archbishop, hope is the antidote to despair. Hope is nurtured by relationship, by community. Despair turns us inward. Hope sends us into the arms of others. Hope sends us into the arms of others. So here's the hard part and the hope. The master's tools are in us. They're in all of us. That's the hard part. But there is more in us than just that. That's the hope. There is the impulse to fairness, the instinct for compassion, and the capacity for joy. All of those are in us as well. So it becomes a choice. We can become more gentle and more compassionate, brighter, more empowered, less fearful. It's a choice. Hope is a choice. It is a life choice. The life we will risk everything for. The only life we have. Rejoice. You're just showing off now, right? <laughs> please, uh, please join me now in our responsive reading. It's entitled, We Must Shine. It's written in your order of service. The author is Christiane de la Huerta. We must shine. We must shine now. This is the goal toward which we stretch step by step in our own time, at our own pace. As our beauty unfolds and our hearts open, we become gentler and more compassionate, yet brighter, more empowered and fearless. We have been holding on, holding back, playing small, hiding our light under a bushel. Enough of that. It is time to let go. We are needed now, all of us, all of us together. All those who feel a calling to be who we are to the fullest, to make a difference, to give it all we got. Let's join now in singing our final hymn.